hey, 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 good people. Grits or cream of wheat? Who the hell is racist? Does anyone ever ask could they touch your hair? <laughs> Woo. Black Like Me. You're listening to Black Like Me with Dr. Alex G., a podcast that invites you to experience the world through the perspective of one black man, one conversation, one story, or even one rant at a time. Here's Dr. G. Hey, 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 good people. I want to welcome you back to another exciting episode of Black Like Me with Dr. Alex G. Hey, I've got an exciting and a real personal episode today. Many of you have been following me on this journey uh, and finding my white relatives, looking at what reconciliation looks like and really trying to put on a new set of lenses um, for understanding race relations um, through U.S. black history. Um, But now, you know, I have these family connections that makes this even more personable. Um, I have a friend and a colleague in the studio today um, who's been working with me because what I've not shared with you is that we've created uh, a documentary called Justified Journey that actually captures this journey on video. And so not only have you been able to listen to my relationships develop and my conversations with John or have seen photos of it, you're actually going to see a video, which is very, very exciting. Um, My guest today is Greg Jeske in the Dane County area here where I live in in Madison. um, He's very familiar. He's come to us um, through our televisions for for years and years and years as as uh, one of the um, co-anchors on one of our special and and, um, um, real popular stations here in Madison. Um, He's a Wisconsinite born and grew up on a farm not far from here, a place called Poinette. And uh, between radio and television, um, he spent about 40 years really interacting with the media. And I'm really glad that he's here. Greg, welcome to Black Like Me. Oh, my pleasure, Alex. Thanks for having me. <laughs> finally. Finally, we, we, yes. We can finally talk about this. This is the thing. It's been a big yeah. secret till now. Now, you know, you guys, I had to like, do a couple of takes on this. So I'm used to looking at Greg's face through a television screen. And he's sitting here in my studio. Um, but no, we're going to talk a little bit about how we've interacted and how we've met. Greg and I probably first interacted... Um, Initially, when when um, you did the Our Wisconsin um, documentary, Equity and Justice for All, or with a question mark, Equity and Justice for All, back in 2016, your station reached out to me and we talked and had an interview. Was that, is that the year right, about 2016? That was, exactly. Um, we got together and you were one of those um, sort of lynch, what I call linchpin interviews for a documentary. <laughs> I think we had about two dozen people who we did. actually appeared in that, in that particular documentary, um, but you were one of those people who was a continuing thread just because you were able to articulate so well sort of the the, the situation at hand, sure. but you also had the personal uh, uh, experiences that you had growing up here in Madison and everything. So we used you quite a bit there. So yeah, we, we, got, to, we got to know each other. We sure did. <laughs> Greg, this crew came to the church. I think we recorded mm-hmm. um, um, in the sanctuary, and I was really, really intrigued because Madison has a reputation of being progressive, but to have Greg, who's who's white, um, and wanting to take a look at Wisconsin's disparity as, on such a deep level captured the attention of many of us who are considered to be black influencers um, in Madison. I remember us saying things to each other, Greg, like, wow, he went there. Like, he asked these questions. And so I know I know that you probably have heard this, and that piece has certainly been lauded, probably not lauded enough. But for many of us who knew or were very well aware of many of the statistics, the statistical realities of the disparities of blacks and whites in Wisconsin, it was refreshing and almost therapeutic to hear a white counterpart um, do the research and bring this to a major um, news outlet um, for the whole state to witness. And so I just, I want you to know that meant a lot to us. Thank you, Alex. Uh, I guess, you know, in in retrospect, the only thing I'd continue to shrug my shoulders about is the fact that nothing's changed since then right <laughs> oh you, right. So you're gonna go there again exactly i, I can't help here it, we are you know? four years four years later and exactly you're 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 right but i will say between the race to equity report justified anger our wisconsin equity and justice for all um documentary the our madison plan that we wrote there has been an awakening and maybe it takes us a while to stop sleepwalking so we've been trying to knock on the door rattle people to know that this is real You have to have been under a rock to know, to believe that these issues aren't real. I guess we just need some more time for people to react to it. But I appreciate the fact that um, you use that platform, that space that you had to help tell a story, because it's one thing for us to talk about it 
in the community, over the pulpits, certain dinners and gatherings we have in the community. But when a major news outlet takes, what was it? Was it like a 90 minute? It was because we uh, had the documentary. Then we did the town hall. We had right. a, a bunch of people in the studio yes. who had watched it. And then we did sort of a Q&A with them just Definitely. to kind of try to build on, on those issues. As you know, you, you, you can only sort of get the tip of the iceberg right. uh, on television a lot of times. Uh, right. So it was nice to have that forum, too. Sure. That was a, that was a great forum. So, so folks, so what happened is, um, you know the story. I'll just say I met John, interacted with John um, through Ancestry.com. He invited me down to New Orleans, did so, caught all this, this good information. But when I came back, I felt like I needed to do something with it. So I reached out to, um, to two colleagues. One was um, Charles Monroe Kane, at, to the best of our knowledge, on, um, on um, public radio, and, um, and Greg Jeske. And I knew him through through the, the uh, station that he was working at at the time. And I said, Greg, I think I've got something to tell. I think I've got this story. I don't know about videos, but I'm a storyteller. Um, and Greg met with me. We had lunch and you started looking over the the um, the, the footage and the photos that we took. And then um, Greg mentioned, you know, I'm I'm doing something different in my life. I want to create documentaries. Um, I'd like to help you on this. And I was blown away because, I mean, I know how busy you know, you are and how busy life can be. Um, I never thought at that initial um, breakfast that we had that what, two years, just that two years later, we'd be sitting down here talking about this finished product. And so um, I'm going to jump right, right into some of the questions that I got around this. I, I just have to say this, Greg, the experience of going to Mississippi and capturing something that's so dear to me, I knew it was important, which is why I went down there is why I invited you to come down. Mm -hmm. Um, but the impact was far greater than what I anticipated. So we'll just fast forward. You are looking at um, uh, the information that I submitted to you. Mm -hmm. We're looking at, well, how do we want to get this out? Do we want to, do we want to do this on a local news outlet? But then you thought, let's make it into a documentary. So we ended up going to Mississippi in 2018. Correct. Um, to the birthplace of my great, great grandfather, Henderson G, who was born a slave to Reuben G. So I think my, my, I think my first question, Greg, is what about the story um, interested you and, and why? It, it, it's just one of those uh, imagination capturing uh, scenarios when you, you think, especially in, in, in American history, that a, an African-American uh, person is going to trace their roots to where the black line of that family actually began. Right, right. Um, it, to me, it was a no-brainer. <laughs> uh, the hardest thing for me, Alex, I think, was was just sort of how am I going to do this? How are we going to do the the vi how are we going to make it visual? Yes. Um, the information is captivating, right? But for me, as a producer, especially for a, uh, as a television right. producer, I have to think how is this going to be interesting on that screen? Sure. Um, that's why when we had our first conversation, I'll never forget. I, I, I was in this little closet of a room talking to you because I, everything in the rest of the building was so loud that day. But I, I, I just couldn't. I was like, "You got video of you guys meeting." I, I <laughs> right. remember. I, I remember I just, you asking me that. Yeah, you actually got that, and so as I started to sort of think, well, how could we do this visually? That was that was the key. That was the start. That was that. That's what made me go. Well, we've got to start. They've got video from New Orleans. They've got the you know they've got that 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 exchange that initial sure. meeting and then your conversation that that you had with John that initially there, um, it, it 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 was a no brainer once I realized that you actually had footage that we could start with, and then as right. we talked, you're the one who was like, well, we should go to Mississippi. Because for me, I was sort of like, well, how how can I make do with what you already have? Right, right. You know, maybe we'd interview, uh, but quite frankly, that really wasn't going to be visually interesting. Sure. There's just what we just didn't have to have enough right. to cover, as we like. That to was say. easy to do for radio. So for NPR, exactly. we could do snippets of conversations. But right. you're right, we're talking about something being visually appealing. Yeah, you can't just do that with a couple of photos and you know some smartphone right um, video. Right. Wow. You know, so tell me a little bit about uh, about the mindset and the heart of. Your your mindset as a as a producer as a, a person who produces documentaries, um, is the passion behind it that that you're a storyteller, or is it that you get to enter into different stories, and experience them? What what like what motivates a um, a documentarian? Is that a, is that a word? Yes, it is. <laughs> to um to really want to engage in, in a variety of, of stories. I have been lucky enough, just as you had mentioned, to have been in the journalism business, if sure. you will, for long enough that 
you know, they, they're, they're, they, they can't teach you the stuff that you learn as a journalist, as a news reporter on the street. They can't really teach you that in school. Right. So right. It, for me, it took a while in my career to kind of get to a point where I was like, so this is what I really want to do here. I want... Because most news stories, if you do a news story, it's going to be two minutes long. And if you're really lucky right, during right. a sweeps month, you might get a four minute long Ooh. piece. But I, uh, well, uh, come on, there, sure. uh, give me an hour. Give me 50 minutes and you can right. put 10 minutes of commercials in there. But but um, I guess over time, I realized that the I needed more time to tell a story Um over the years, I was able to, you know, learn by mistakes and stuff when I did my mm -hmm. first documentaries uh, out in Reno, Nevada um, in, in the mid-90s. Um, anyway, you, you, you start to realize, okay, sure. here's what I can do with 50 minutes of TV time. Um, and, and you watch other documentaries. Um, and, and you learn some of the tricks and all that. But back to back, more back to your <laughs> your question. I'm really not good at being on this side of the microphone. No, <laughs> no, you're good. You're doing well. <laughs> really you're doing not. well. <laughs> I go all over the place. Um, but it, it, the, the, to me... It's the idea of telling a story, an interesting story that hasn't been told yet. Mm -hmm. um, and, 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 and sometimes it's as easy as um, bringing out small um, uh, things that you didn't know within a bigger uh, frame. I, I did a um, documentary on the drinking culture in Wisconsin, mm -hmm. and that was very much like that. Stuff that you knew, but then stuff that you didn't know. So it's a learning experience when you're doing this. Absolutely. Absolutely. Was there any part of the story of, of you know, my chasing, tracing my roots? I mean, you and I are in the, of the same generation, close to the same right. age. Mm -hmm. So we remember when Alex Haley's roots. Yeah. Um, came out when I refer when I asked my daughter about it. She thinks either about the second generation or okay. or you know just some reference to it. But that riveted America. I Absolutely. mean, it, I, I I remember what that felt like being you know um, you know a teenager and 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 seeing the history of African Americans played out on television. I didn't I didn't know. I mean, mm -hmm. I'd seen photos, but I didn't really know. And so, but I'm just curious as you as you listen to the story and why I wanted to connect with with my history, even tracing it back to the ugliness of slavery. Was there anything about the story? We know that, why, that it interested you because you like to tell stories, but did any any part of it, the idea of any of it resonate with you for, um, for you know, for any for any key reasons that made you think this is important. This oh. is important to tell. Maybe even on a, you know, on a, because you live in Madison or family or anything. I'm just curious if anything about it just resonated with you. I think it, uh, what what really did it, Alex, is I had the um, the backdrop and the knowledge of sure. that first documentary that that yes. we just talked about, the Our Wisconsin Equity right. and Justice for All, and your story, in my mind was going to be that personal, here's an example of what mm -hmm. we're talking about. The documentary, the, yes. uh, the, the Our Wisconsin documentary kind of dealt with everything on, uh, tried to bring out the various systemic problems. And, and, and we did segments on health disparities and education disparities. And that was all well and good. I mean, it, right. was, it was more of an educational thing, but what attracted me to your story other than the fact that uh, what I mentioned in terms of just the, the sure. aha moment was the fact that, um, I knew that this was, I, I, and I knew we could put it together in a way that it would represent all those issues that we had talked about in that in that previous documentary. Sure, and on actually show the history level. of them on a personal exactly. level. Exactly, exactly. No. So when I threw out the idea about going to Mississippi to catch some footage, you said, hmm, that might be a possibility. Let me talk to my camera person. And then you got back in touch with me and said, hey, Jason and I can do that. I was floored because I thought, okay, never in a million years am I going to get a producer and a professional, a professional producer, professional camera person to actually spend a couple of days. So we rented a van. We left Madison. We left the church parking lot at what, like 445, yep, yep. really early, first thing in the morning. And um, Tyler, my, my podcast manager, was with us. And we headed down to Mississippi. And I, a couple of times, I think it crossed my mind. What the hell are we about to do? <laughs> Never mind, we were going down there in July. You remember yeah, that? Right, right. In Mississippi, right? Exactly. <laughs> and, and, you know, Mississippi. Um, but the journey was, was incredible. I remember before we got to our hotels and got checked in, um, I had been trying to find relatives. And I knew where the um, Center Hill Baptist Church uh, Cemetery was. That's where my great great grandfather was buried. So we'll get to that in a minute. Okay. But remember, we pulled off in Kosciuszko. And I said, yes. you know, my father talked about being from Kosciuszko. And that's where we found the white relatives. Remember right. that? I think, and, and, and we were trying to find RLG. And um, I think, did Tyler, Tyler find it? Yeah. Tyler found it. It's like, hey, I think I found it. That was that was incredible because I've been seeing pictures 
of RLG. He's my he's my great great grandfather Henderson's half brother. So RLG was white, a son of Reuben G, and of course Henderson was as well. But for that to be our first stop, we'd driven all day. Um, you know, you know, it was, it was early evening. We hadn't gone to our hotel, hadn't showered or changed, mm-hmm. but we found RL and his wife's um, their, their 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 grave site. It just sort of kicked things off that, all right, this isn't fictional. This isn't just something I read on Ancestry.com. These folks ex- these folks, folks existed and they died and I'm standing at their grave. So I'm curious, as you watch me standing there at RLs, I mean, he's my great, great uncle, mm-hmm. um, if I'm counting that right. He's, yeah, he's great, great, or three greats. He's, yeah, he's yeah. uncle, yeah. <laughs> um, was the story or or the, the visualization of the story unfolding for you at that point or had you already figured out what the what the layout would look like, hopefully. You know, I I, I and I'm glad you asked that question, Alex, because I, I I do want to make the point that Justified Journey is my first effort at what I would call a non-narrative documentary. I am not in this in any way, shape, or form. That's right. This, this is essentially a documentary film. Okay, yeah, that's a good uh, clarification, uh, you right? Know, You're uh, right. You don't have some announcer in the background going, and then Alex went over. We put this together. Uh, by the grace uh, uh, of right. the Lord and the universe, sure. we were able to put this together in a way that hopefully will make sense to everyone. Um, uh, I saw the story folding out on the way down there, actually. Really? Tell me about that. Well, well, my whole thing, Alex, is I, especially as a documentarian, I don't want to have a preconceived notion. Now, you're, of course you. you're going you. to. Sure. But I do not want to direct in any way what's going to what we're going to shoot and that's why you know I'm always the guy mm-hmm. behind the cameraman I never I don't sure. want to be in the shot I I was always the guy trying not to talk because I didn't want to be I, I wanted you to be out there walking through the cemetery mm-hmm. without me and and I needed the viewers to Got be you. with you not me be with you so so there were times oh, that's when brilliant. Uh, because there were times where and it's almost you almost think it's rude or something but I I hate to do so much prep with okay Alex when we go into the cemetery I'm not going to talk to you right. you just do your own thing cuz then you start thinking about that right. um and again I am I'm trying to just comp- like you guys just gave me space as I walked up to that gravesite cuz it was a surreal moment yeah that's why you're giving me so much space to walk around it and and the key is just roll the camera Wow. That, that that's to me yeah you yeah ca- you, you and that's literally you are capturing the moment um and yes when we were there and when when tyler and you have to understand this is an old cemetery in Kosciuszko, yes, it Mississippi. Is. yes it, is. it is hard to find gravestones it is hard to find names on gravestones mm-hmm. so to actually have found rl was you know yeah i was about to give up i exactly. really was i, I was going to say miracle but let's not go there sure, it was sure. a very uh, a great uh, fortune for us to sure, have actually sure. found that um and the 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 story um yes i i saw it playing out the whole time but i uh, from my eyes uh, it plays out as it's happening sure when i see you there and I, and, and 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 reflecting and and there's just one there, there's this one shot where you're reflecting on something and there's a dog that barks in the background during mm-hmm. one pause mm-hmm. When you see that in the film, it is powerful. It, it is, and 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 why? It just is. Sure, um, sure. You know, it. it uh, one of the things that hit me as I stood there was um, I had I had gone to the black graveyard behind um, behind the church. I think at least two times. Okay. But what hit me in that old Kosciuszko, um cemetery is that it, it was it, it must have been the white cemetery, but that these are my relatives as well. I mean, I'd spoken to my white relatives and we're reconciling the past and we're figuring out what that, what that means. Mm -hmm. But standing there, I'm realizing like, I'm a descendant of this guy as well. Like this guy's dad is my great, great, great grandfather. So this isn't, this isn't like a distant cousin. Like there's a connection to this. So I think even at that, at that initial cemetery visit, um, the thought of how I reconcile being the descendant of a slave and a slave owner sort of converged on me. In that space, and and I do remember one moment that 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 again was one of those um, uh, examples of sure. of of what you you look for in these things. It's when you put two and two together as you looked at the um, headstone death dates that Henderson was actually the older right. of those two. You had not been told right. you you had been told the opposite exactly. that, that the white RL was the older brother, right. older half brother. But, but he wasn't. He, wasn't. he was like so nine think of years that younger, too. Right. That, you know, that the older, younger thing. Right. That that Reuben G, the slave owner's first son, 
was my great great grandfather. His first son was black. Exactly. And so that made me ask questions about the dynamic between, um, of course, Aurelia, Reuben's wife, mm -hmm. and Venus Henderson's mom, who was a slave to Reuben. Um, right. When I when I saw that put the two and two together, you're right. That was a very powerful moment, and that made me glad that the cameras was going because that's not something I wanted to come back and recount. Like you, sure. the camera was on me as I started doing the math. Right. So um, that piece is really interesting. Another thing that I discovered um, since our trip is that I found census records from 18, um, Ruben was born in 1847, so 1850, 51, okay. that Ruben had 12, that's say Ruben again, that Henderson, when I tell the story, I get it mixed up, that when Henderson, my great, great grandfather was born, it was in, it was in 47, 1847. But when I found the census of 1850, it showed that Ruben had about 12 slaves. One of them was a three-year-old boy. Interesting. Yes, really, really oh. interesting. And then one was a woman who was 33, which would have been Ruben's age, which I'm assuming um, was, was Venus. Was Venus, yeah. But, um, but I think putting the story together um, the way it's been put together, like through a family gathering years ago where I first saw a picture of Henderson and his wife, Amanda, mm -hmm. and then um, fast forwarding and learning more about him and then meeting white relatives and then finding his, his gravestone. But it was another thing to find the census that had a category for slave ownership and the age and the gender of them. That that just solidified what the relationship was like so that even I'm and I'm not tempted to romanticize that relationship, but just seeing the way it was designated on paper yeah. made it very, very clear that he was Reuben's son, but he was also Reuben's slave because Reuben had to account for him. Um, wow. Then the next day we went to um, we met my cousin, David. Mm -hmm. uh, he's a descendant of Henderson as well and had been a city um, councilman in, in Carthage, Mississippi took us to the black cemetery um, and we went to the white cemetery. So right. there was, so and yeah. so in Leake County um, we found more, we found more G relatives, but the one um, the behind the first church um, center Hill was like all the black relatives. And we found um, Henderson's gravestone and Amanda's gravestone. And I'd been there before. So that wasn't okay. the same emotional um, experience, but what did touch me or hit me is that everyone else in that cemetery who was a relative, was also a descendant mm -hmm. of Henderson. So I realized just how significant he was to that area because his grandchildren donated land for um, the first school um, in that area. And his children, grandchildren, nieces, nephews were the founders of that church in 1871. I mean, you know, Civil War happens in the 1860s. You have the emancipation of slavery in the 1860s. In 71, Black folks are building churches and they have a cornerstone. They have chartered it. So not just physically constructed it, but they built a whole charter around it, which shows the innovation and of African-American. they had been planning this thing, too. They that had means, been planning it. You know, it wasn't just a let's do right, it now. Right, right. So. so for me, um, we it's easy to think that the South is a bad experience. It's Southern. Um, it All of these negative kinds of connotations. But yet so much of my history was was affirmed there. Like I found um, David showed me the grave of his of his grandfather, who was a coroner and um, and a tax. He did something. I, it wasn't taxes. He was a coroner. He had two jobs. But I said, wait a minute. I live in Wisconsin in the north. I've never met nor heard of a black coroner. So the advances that these folks were making 100 years ago makes some of the advances today dull in comparison um, and that we're not really gaining ground as we would have thought. We've actually lost some of that ground. Well, one of the things that I, I hope people will really be able to follow and get out of, of, of watching this film, Alex, um, is that transformation that you literally go through, um, you as in you, Alex mm -hmm. G. Jr., um, as you start finding out these weren't just poor um, field hands. Field hands, right? Field hands, exactly. These are people who had an enclave right. and a thousand acres of land. A thousand acres. Um, and you find yourself at one point, and you say <laughs> yeah. it right in, 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 the, in the documentary, as, as people will, will watch and hear, that you're suddenly finding yourself, however this might be, more comfortable 
in Mississippi more yes. related to this that that situation than you might have been up here. Right. Right. You know? I mean, you write an article, you do some innovative things and people say, oh, you're a black leader. Not that you're a leader, right. but you're a black leader. So you, you, you're you sharp for a black guy. But then you realize that your family's been managing a thousand acres for close to a century. And I didn't know that. Now, the people who grew up in Mississippi, southern backwards Mississippi, and I say that facetiously, mm -hmm. tongue in cheek. And there's a street named after them. Like you saw G Road yeah. and then David, you know, cousin David was saying, well, that's where your great grandfather Oscar was born. And that's where cousin Betty's from. And that's where cousin, you know, Ophelia's from. And I just started to think differently, differently about my place in the world that had I known that land ownership and having streets named after your family or coming from a family that has name recognition mm -hmm. in a place like Mississippi, the advancements that my family made in Mississippi um, had I known that, I would have navigated Wisconsin differently um, because I wouldn't have approached everything that I've approached um, with a sense of newness. I'm I'm ice breaking. That if I had known, well, this is just part of the legacy. This is what we do. This is how we roll as G's. Um, I wouldn't have dumbed down in certain scenarios and I would have been less apologetic in other places where, where I've wanted to exert leadership. Hi, this is Jeremy Holiday, and I'm one of the editors of the Black Like Me show. And I just want to take a minute now to talk to you a little bit about Patreon. The show that we put together here is the culmination of an effort of a lot of people. And in order to do it, we need your support. We've been working for a while to come up with a Patreon that works well for people. And the levels that existed before, we recently added the $2 level, which is there for you if you like the show and you just want to give a little bit of support. It's cheaper than a cup of coffee. I mean, I don't think you can find a cup of coffee anywhere or half a cup of coffee for $2. And we have a $6 level where you'll get a shout out on the show, a $10 level where you can submit questions to Dr. G and he'll respond to them. And then the $25 level, which is whenever we have a live event, you get a VIP invite. And whenever we start producing merch, you get that merch as well. So if you like what you hear on the show and you want to support it, go to patreon.com slash black like me and check out the levels to see if one fits for you. Now back to Dr. G. I remember also that the white G's in Lee County were buried not far away. We went to the other, right? That other graveyard. Right. And um, what's interesting is the same names, G, Clayton, mm -hmm. um, um, Wagoner. Um, I'm like, okay, so... We know that these folks are having babies together, but they're buried separately. It's like, okay, so all this stuff is going on. All of these relationships are going on, illicit, illegal, forced, but yet people are are, are buried separately, like they're planning a separate hereafter, a, right. a segregated heaven. Right. But you, again, this was Tyler, found um, Hattie G. Hattie was um, Henderson. And RLG's sister was, because she was white, it was RL's full sister, but it was Henderson's half-sister. And the gravesite of her and her four children who were murdered, butchered, their house was set on fire, and they were all buried together. Again, I'd read that in newspapers, mm -hmm. but to walk in and to find that grave site, again, it felt like it was transporting me um, back to a historical place that this is, that this is real. Um, and I had to even ask myself the question, um, what would, and it's hinted at that, that the KKK was involved. Mm -hmm. What would make the KKK want to murder white people, wealthy white people, land owning white people. And so that's a whole nother piece that's, that's opening up for me, but just, um, seeing the same names in the black and white cemeteries that did something to me also, Greg. Yeah. And, and, and again, I think that that is something that, that you do see in, in this sure. documentary. Um, you might wonder, I've never been, uh, you know, you, you might wonder if you were like me, how much are we really going to get out of following this guy around in the cemetery? Right. <laughs> or cemeteries, right. as, as it turned out to be. Well, you know, without, you know, giving everything away, um, you, it, it was captivating. Yes. Um, and, and again, that, that to me, uh, that that's what I saw it develop over the, and we were only there for two and a half days, uh, right. we, we should point out. Right. This was a very, you know, uh, involved, uh, intentional, jam-packed trip. Exactly. It was an um, intensive. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but but the 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 what was revealed during those visits and 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 the, the the chance that it gave you to sort of just stand right there at that grave site yes, and yes. be able to start to process this again. Hopefully, we were able to convey that. I think we did just because we were rolling the camera on you. Sure. Um, but it was captivating. Uh, it, it really was. There's a um, 
and I guess you don't know it until you are the person who is related to those sure, those sure, names. Sure. Um, but when you start putting all the pieces together, it um, it, it was it was it was profound. I think so too. <laughs> you, know? you know, and I, I have to be careful that I don't give too much of this away because I want everyone who's listening and their friends and networks to to watch this film. Not just because it's about my life, but it's a lens through which we're able to really see America and American history. That's why I think it's so important to people. But I'm curious, um, as you as you experienced the the trip down there, then what we saw while there and back, and even the time since then, um, I'm curious what aspects of being in the rural South in Mississippi caused you to think differently about American history or. Um, how you learned history. I'm just, I'm just curious about what's, what might've been a huge aha about, about history or America. I'm um, doing those couple of days in Mississippi with me. You know, I guess from, uh, from the point of a, a, a documentary producer who again is, is just rolling on what's on, on the experience. Right. You're kind of hoping for experiences to sure. reveal themselves. Um, and I will say one thing that the, one thing I tell people about that, this whole thing is I had an eye out for Confederate flags. I'll just say it. Mm-hmm. I, 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 that I felt that that would have been a shot to sort of portray what's still going on down there. Sure. Well, you you can attest. We we saw maybe one. I, I remember sure. one on a billboard. Sure. We were going too fast on the interstate to actually get a shot mm-hmm. of it. Mm-hmm. Um, but so I guess that uh, I I would just say I was a little taken aback that there wasn't more um, uh, pushback to what we were doing. That we didn't see uh, more. I don't know evidence of the old South. It didn't. It didn't come across like that. To right. Me. Not not in those parts. It should right. have. Did. I was surprised by that too. Yeah. Um, you know, without, without giving too much of it away, but we, you know, you got a chance to interview folks who are, who are my relatives, black and white. I'm just curious. Were you surprised or surprised that you weren't surprised by some of the interactions, particularly with the non-black relatives? I was surprised, Alex, that a majority of the people we talked to have also delved into their family history that surprised me also you know but folks and you will you will see them in the documentary people who you don't necessarily look at and go i bet you they've traced their roots right, uh, right. right? i mean no sure. and, and again this is just being very superficial sure. but you know sure. that's that's that that first glance kind of thing but was it was very surprising to me how they embraced it Yes, you know. Yes, um, and again, as a, as a, I, I had, I was very, I had my radar up for mm-hmm. the opposite. Right, I had my radar up for make sure you know you keep a, a camera on this person for their reaction to seeing Alex, right, and, and that sort of thing. And you know, we didn't catch anybody. Right. Uh, you know, uh, not that that was the point at all. But again, j- you know, or the purpose of it at all, Alex. But just you know, I- as far as being the the producer of something visual, you look for visual. Oh, of moments. course. Okay, you want those uh, reactions. Exactly. There's something that w- that's not caught in the film because it just because of the way it happened. But when one cousin was reaching out to another cousin because I wanted to see a gravesite, I wanted to find Ruben's gravesite. Um, she she called her cousins Mary. She called her cousin and said, "Yeah, we have some ra- we have some family here, some relatives here, and they want to see Ruben's grave. I'm sending them down to you. Can you please show them around?" It wasn't like, you know, that black cousin I was telling you about, or you know, some of our black relatives. So I, I don't I didn't feel like um, that cousin had a heads up of right. who I was, what I looked like. And if you remember when we pulled up, I'm in I, I'm in a van. <laughs> <laughs> in Mississippi with three white men and uh, we pull up to a white relatives, you know, house. And I said, I, I sort of said it tongue in cheek, but I really meant it. I was like, um, I need one of you to go knock on the door because I, I'm not going to get out of this van uh-huh. and go knock on the door and say, guess who's coming to dinner or whatever. Right. But, um, but people will see in, um, in the documentary, the exchange and the information that we gathered was just, um, was another very powerful experience that interchange. I won't say much about it because I want people just to, to really savor it as they watch it, but was just as powerful as seeing RL's grave, yeah. just because of the uh, about how we've learned about history and how um, how we approach history. And and there are some big ahas that I won't even hint at because I just want people to to I want people to have that experience that wow factor as they're as they're watching it. But I realized that there were things that my white relatives could connect me to in terms of history mm-hmm. that that the black relatives couldn't, and that was very powerful. Yeah. They had some good stories. They had some good so stories they, you know, who, that seemed to be pretty close to the source. It didn't seem to be right. that far removed. Right. Uh, th- those discussions that they had. Right. You know, you know it's interesting. Um, my father told me 
that um, he that that his father, my, which would be Ernest G., my grandfather, would tell him about having white relatives and that they would the kids would play together until the other white relatives came. And then then the black kids would have to go through the back door um, again. And, and uh, he told me that um, that his grand that my grandfather, Ernest, said that one of his uncles or there's an old man named Thomas G., who was a blue eyed white man. Um, my entire life, I just thought that he was referring to very fair-skinned people. Okay. That's because sometimes folks have referred to my mom that way. So real fair-skinned black people are sometimes, my older people call that. Mm -hmm. But when I got down and saw the G store and saw that it was founded by Thomas W. G., I was blown away. Because again, you hear these stories, you hear, you have these family, family, um, 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 griots who are saying, here's what happened. And then you see this name of what was passed down to you in story. And again, you just realize this was this was real, because I guess for most of my life, um, by not being raised by my biological father, I did not know a lot about the about the Mississippi mm -hmm. history. But when we would interact, he would tell me some of it. And my mom would tell me stories that he told her. But to see those names and that space yeah. um, was was very, very moving. I'm curious. Um, because as a producer, you're hoping you're looking for things that will that will help to enhance the story. Mm -hmm. um, were there any places, any scenes where um, even at the end of the night when the cameras and things were away, um, where the story touched you, Greg, the man, and not necessarily the producer? And again, about about the way you think about Madison or the world or how the, the how far we've come or how far we've yet to come. I just know when when as people listen, I know that they're interested um, just how any of this may have just cause you to think about the world differently on a personal, not producer, yeah. but on a personal level about what you think about race relations or how far we're, we've, we've come. I, I, I think one, one point that I really am taken by in, in this whole thing is, is uh, again, your reaction to feeling in, in ways more at home down there than up here. Um, and more connected down here, down there than up here. And to be honest with you, it, 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 it just, I don't know really how to articulate this, other than, other than it didn't, uh, you almost wanted to, um, you almost wanted to say, you know what, Madison and, and the North, you know, uh, there's a lot of understanding to be reached and whatnot, but you can kind of learn from the situation down there sure. and not just uh, 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 criticize it. Uh, I mean, the, the history of the Deep South is the history of the Deep South, but what it is today, even with that backdrop, I, I was surprised. I, it, mm -hmm. I, I was, um, in some ways, made maybe a little more hopeful. I, I, you know, again, we didn't spend a ton of sure. time down there. We didn't talk to every, you know, white right. person down there to know just how um, deep seated things are, or how maybe things have been, you know, mm -hmm. uh, 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 improved sure. in, in their mentality. Um, but it gives me hope for that mm -hmm. because we did experience. 99% and I and I just leave the 1% uh, out mm -hmm. there a positive experience uh, you know um it it wasn't a, that was a surprise to me and uh, it, it left me kind of hopeful that sure you know it's not just because it was that way there it seems as though there 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 are, there are improvements being made and not not necessarily the white people making improvements for black people but Black people, uh, you know, um, like you said, owning businesses, and they're not like the one in town, right? Um, you know, that it's now the population is higher, so you would hope that would be the case, but um, it's still Mississippi, exactly, exactly, right, right. Um, you know, as you grew up in Poinette, so you you went to high school in Poinette, yes. Also, um, now we have to think back a ways to high school, but was Southern history? Black history roots. talked about. That's why we both remember Roots the same that, way because that was I was it. sitting in the farmhouse as you were sitting in your home here in Madison, watching watching it. that same thing but night that, after night. So, <laughs> so as you studied U.S. history, did it just sort of glass over um, U.S. Black history uh, or slavery? Absolutely. I mean, there was mention of it, Alex. It was obviously uh, sure. uh, uh, part of that early on. But there was never any any anything in depth, in depth. about Reconstruction um, or, or, any or anything like that. No. So for me, I was, so I'm curious about. Um, I mean, because this was a powerful experience um, for me. But I felt you're seeing that with me, 
caused a bond with us because I, I mean I wasn't experiencing this mm -hmm. in you know in a vacuum. I mean, although you were standing behind the camera, you were still still there experiencing it. So as we walked around and you saw aspects of Black history because you're in Mississippi that you didn't learn about mm -hmm. in school, um, were there things you saw about the strength, the innovation of um, of Black folks in in such you know dire straits that would be helpful to all children today if 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 we're taught better or taught differently. I'm, I'm curious, did, did any thoughts about um, the need to connect what really happened with our progressive educational systems where kids don't understand the innovation, kids of all ethnic backgrounds, because that's not just important for black kids, but I think it, it would help the white children who lived in those places exactly. saw black innovation. Mm -hmm. As progressive as we are in Madison, white children don't see black innovation. We just talk about black kids not seeing it, but white kids don't see it. And that might be why some of the white relatives weren't as shocked because although their grandparents may have had a certain view of African-Americans, mm -hmm. they still saw innovation and things in black folks that white folks in progressive Wisconsin don't see. And I'm just, I'm curious, that was apparent to me. I'm just curious if that ever, I asked that clumsily, I'm sort of thinking through it, but I, I'm just curious if you if you witnessed with me um, the potential of beneficial information in history, if those strides, struggles and strides and successes were taught more in places like Madison. You know, I don't, I, I think absolutely, Alex, and I think, you know, it's, it's, it's a given that one of the big hurdles to changing any of the disparities or any of the attitudes has so much to do with the early education. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. For 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 the especially as as time has gone on and we've reached the the the, the crux of things that we have with race relations in this country in the year twenty twenty yes there needs to be thought about okay let's let, let, let's start this earlier um, where 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 can we catch them to give give people kids a balance in their own mind right that there's not a better right. or a worse right um, skin color skin color I mean are we really in the year twenty twenty and and I know I have, sure I, I'm preaching to the choir or whatever but it's still that that, that that really fascinates me that that for being such a scientific and and technologically mm -hmm. advanced society that we are still dumbed down on skin color being being right. some some uh, 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 factor of good or bad or different intelligence exactly exactly that we're still adhering to some of that yes so I think definitely uh, Alex there needs to be in the curriculum of Elementary school kids, as they learn about the pilgrims, and, and the, there needs to be a, a, a more, a fuller sure. accounting sure. of America's uh, history with, with with African Americans. It is what it is. There right. is no undoing right. it. Why not come up with a curriculum that explains it so the uh, in in a way that people can understand that wasn't the way to do it. You can see why people ended up. With, with with such a behind the eight ball kind of thing, sure. um, in, in, in even today, there is a reason, um, and it all goes back to the history. Right, it, it just does. And, and what I think you've done an incredible job of, and I haven't said this on the air yet, but but I, you invited me over to your home for a viewing of the documentary. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to cry at the end of it because even though you, it it just was put together so well, and I'm a storyteller, but you know. It's, been over a course of several months that we filmed. I sent photos to you. We talked. You it's interviewed process, me. We, it's it? a process. <laughs> but the way that it was woven together was was really powerful. But I think what you've helped to create, Greg, um, with the um, Our Wisconsin documentary is it states where we are. Mm -hmm. But the justified journey gives the backdrop of how we got there. Because for me as an African-American, I want people to know that I don't want to be pitied. Um but I do want people to understand that when other groups talk about pulling up themselves by their bootstraps, they're probably talking about my great, great, great grandmother or great, great grandfather. Those are the bootstraps because if people realize that we're not at this place of economic disparity because my people were lazy or shiftless, but there were actual rules and things put in place. I think that positions us to to create a more positive trajectory. So what you've done is in your work, you've created a snapshot of where Wisconsin is. But through the lens of just one black person and one one black and white family, what happened 120 years ago that created some of those realities? It's very interesting. And, and, and for me, the fact that Henderson G's son, Oscar, moved out of Mississippi to Milwaukee and is, is buried in Milwaukee, that the connection in my family between Mississippi and Milwaukee 
um, it, that that that's just real. And to 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 know that Miss that Mississippians saw Wisconsin and particularly Milwaukee as a land of opportunity. There are factory jobs and industry. Um, and at one point in the early seventies, was it was considered one of the best places for black families to live. So I think you've put these two pieces together that allows us to look at where we are, but consider the way history um, has shaped this reality. And if we don't, if we don't really pay attention to the historical pieces that led to where we are right now, we will repeat them unknowingly. And one of the greatest Constantly. mistakes I'm seeing is just, it's just ignorance of not of understanding we're perpetuating something that has made us already so divided. Let's just stop it. So for me, looking back is just to say, this is real. This is why we are where we are. Let's course correct. Right. Like let's, we can't go back and erase the history, but we will be, we will be oblivious to the impact of history. If we don't look back and understand the gaps is not due to shiftlessness or lack of intelligence is due to a systemic reality that we now must wait, work to undo as we move ahead. And so, um, you know, the Our Wisconsin piece and the Justified Journey piece um, really enables folks like myself and others who care about history and where we're going and sociology and psychology and culture and faith. Um, you've made it easier to talk about where we've been, where we are and where we're going because of your commitment to telling those stories. And they've just been powerful, Greg. Well, Alex, thank you. Um, I, I'm flattered and, and thank you very much. I, I, I do want to, before I forget, is to give credit to Jason Weiss of Jason yes, Weiss Video. Yes. Um, you had mentioned his name a little earlier, sure. but Jason was a photographer and editor for this documentary. And he did a it beautiful job. It should be said right off the top wow. that, that Jason and I uh, joined forces on this um, w right after I began my production company sure, sure. and did this you know, without um, a budget. So to speak, sure. um, and so I I, I want to put out full appreciation to to Jason and his incredible work and his. He effort. traveled with. He got yeah, in that van with us. Yeah, yeah. Wow. What's your hopes for the for um, the documentary? As you think, you know, you know, down the road, what as you're dreaming. So, so I know mm -hmm. as a producer, you you got this this realistic lane. Well, this is where I've got to stay. But considering all that we've talked about, um, where do you hope it goes, and what are you hoping it'll do? I really hope it it goes to as many outlets as we can possibly get it sure. to. Um, what I'm hoping it'll do as much as anything, is, and, and and how I'd really like to see this used, and mm -hmm. I know you're going to be using it um, in, in this way with some of your events, Alex, it's the perfect thing to start a conversation mm -hmm. it's a it, it's it's not a two-hour program to sit through it's it's very uh, manageable time wise sure is and then uh, to me they're, they're, they're just like anything else we could only include so much in the in right the, in, in the um, final film version but it's just such a great kickstarter for for conversations into into the history I mean you know Nobody would want their history to be forgotten. It's how they You're got right. here. It's it's why I am why I am. Even even just the history of my own life. Right. So so how can't we back up uh, and look at the history of our country and kind of realize that we didn't learn it all? How can we how could we not have learned about the Great Migration in school? Right. I had to read a book about it when I was forty five years old. Exactly. Now it goes to me. I understand that's on me for not learning it sooner. Point being, these are these are huge parts of our history that that aren't even taught in school right and it needs to be part of that curriculum um as a journalist i've always considered myself sort of a modern day historian sure. just kind of recording it as it goes that along. makes sense but there is nothing more important to us than history sure i mean we we constantly repeat the mistakes of the past constantly um and part of it's human nature but part of it is also laziness and 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 not wanting to to say okay i i'm giving you my 100% attention. I put my phone down and I'm actually going to have a conversation with you right. about this. And and that's where we need to go. And that's what I hope the, the this program will do is help give people an idea of of what that history is, but even more so maybe to have a discussion about it. Maybe to take it to I, to me to me again we we're, we're really um hurting ourselves as a country and and you make this point uh, much better than I do Alex, but we 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 hurt ourselves by not including everybody exactly. in in the, in, the, in, the, in the race. Exactly. You know, I, this is a big race. It's the human yes. race. Come on. Yes. How, how can you? How, how, yes. You know, I'm hoping that um, 
that more non-African Americans will really engage in the conversation as well. You know, we, we have this um, through our Justified Anger Initiative. We have a U.S. Black History course, nine week course that we've now done for five years. We, we we're two episodes, two um, sessions away from cl- completing our fifth um, our fifth year of doing this. And many times the white participants will say, well, where are the African-American folks? I said, you know, either through story or around family or through church, we've talked about the ugly history of the country, but to have our non-black allies or non-black counterparts to understand this history and that it's not ancient history that I can find the graves mm-hmm. of the first black G and when the G family became dark, that this is my grandfather's grandfather. So think about your grandparents, how close you are to them, and then think about how close they are to their grandparents. That's how close I am to slavery. So when people begin to realize that this is real, but we can turn this because it's not it's not a thousand years of this, you know, this level of oppression. Sure. It's been four hundred. But mm-hmm. we can tu- we can we can turn it if we become aware. And so I think that this is a powerful tool. I can't wait to use this um, around the country. I've already talked to folks in New Jersey, New York, who want to show it um, actually in conversations with folks in Long Beach, California, who want to do it um, in San Diego. And I'm actually scheduled um, in Seattle um, to, to talk about this in two different um, forms. And so Great. I'm, I'm just so excited. And so Greg, thank you for your work. Thank you for your vision, but thank you also for your willingness to partner with me on this. I got way more out of this than I really bargained for because when you got your smartphone and a couple of video clips, you know, at John's place in new Orleans, I never thought that we'd be sitting here today. And now John's nephew, um, Brandon is a pastor in Long Beach, really, and we're actually in discussions about showing this and talking about our family. So oh, yeah. he is a descendant of RL as well. So, mm-hmm. be, so, um, and I took a picture of the two of us. He took me out for dinner, and then I put in the corner of it a photo of RL and Henderson. Okay, and I tell people we are descendants of the we are descendants of brothers, and um, you know it's not like these distant cousins. Like we are descendants. Um, yeah, this you know, is not brothers. some far branch on right. this tree, folks. When right. you see this, right. it's, it's tight. <laughs> I mean, when I sit with Brandon, I realize our grandparents were like first cousins. Right. And yeah, that's that's close. And we're looking at what does this mean? Both of us being a part of the communities of faith, we're talking about what's our story as one family to help put a lens on, um, on faith, religion, church, America, because... And how do we begin to make this real? Because so many people think it's this history is not so real or it's so distant, it's not relevant. We're trying to bring the, that conversation to a real familial level mm-hmm. and to places of faith that don't always talk about this. We talk about how we work together and the kumbaya-ness of sure. it, but not really how we got here. So uh, I'm really looking forward to that. But this project has helped to make that possible. So. Um, so, so Greg, remind me that the name of your production company is J Dog. J Dog Productions. J Dog. So, my guest has been um, Greg Jeske, who is the who is the um, the owner of J Dog um, Productions. He's a producer, um, and has really helped a story that's been in my DNA for a century and a half, but it's been in my heart for the past couple of decades. Ever since I saw um, Roots, I wanted to tell my family story never thinking that one day I would be able to. Um, so thank you for helping make that dream come to come true, Greg, and for creating it in a way so that it's not just something that can be um, used or consumed by my family or our local context, but really helping me to initiate a broader discussion about how we can learn from the past and really create a brighter future for all of us. So I can't wait to um, get in front of some live audiences and watch this with you Mm -hmm. and process um, this with you. And hopefully Jason will be um, at those as well. Um, But thank you for stopping by the studio to talk about this. And um, I just feel that this is going to just garner great success. And I just appreciate your creativity um, and your talent that you brought to this table. So thank you for the work on Justified Journey and for um, being uh, part of Black Like Me. Well, thanks for the opportunity to do Justified Journey, because again, this is a first for me, and it's a huge first. Yes. So I I can't even tell you professionally how that helps. But my pleasure to be here, of course. All right, thank you so much, thank you so much. Hey, thank you for being a part of Black Like Me. 
Um, and as always, we want you to, to subscribe so that you, you'll never miss an episode. We'd love it when you become a part of our Patreon family. So please click in the link below to do this. We also have a link to Greg Jeske's production company because you might have some needs or some things or some stories that you want to tell as well. And as always, we want you, we want you to learn. We want you to think differently about things. We want you to share this link with as many people as you can and allow it to change you so that you enter the world in a fashion that helps it to be a little bit better um, um, after you've after you've been a part of it. So don't just listen and have your heads filled. Let your hearts be full and do something. Think something. Go someplace that's really different um, in order to make this place a better place. All right. Thank you. I want to thank Corey Saffold for creating the music for this podcast. My podcast manager, Tyler Nyland, engineer and editor, Eli Steenlich, my editor, Jeremy Holiday, and a special thank you to WORT Studios, where we record Black Like Me. Thank you for listening to today's podcast. You can find out more about Dr. Alex G's amazing work at www.alexg.com. Black Like Me is sponsored by the generosity of the Human Family Unity Foundation. Ooh, black like me.